Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Drones Plus AR for Vigil Intelligence for first responders. Today, my name is Brandon with DJI. We'll be starting the webinar here in the next 10 minutes. Um, so please just hang on. If you have any questions, um, feel free to add them into the question or chat channel. And we'll be doing a kickoff in the next 10 minutes here.
Hello, everyone. This is Brandon with DJI. We'll be starting the webinar at the hour. Um, thank you for joining. And if you have any issues or questions, feel free to add them into the chat session um, as far as connection. Thank you. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. Hello everyone and welcome to the DJI webinar for drones and augmented reality, looking at visualization and intelligence for first responders. My name is Brandon Montalato with DJI. I'm our program manager for some of the enterprise solutions that we develop at DJI. Um, our office is actually in Palo Alto, California, where we do some of our leading research and development, as well as all of the development for the SDK. Today, I'm very excited to invite a few people from DJI, Edgy Beast, and the Oshawa County Fire Department. Um, the goal here today is to talk a little bit about how drones leveraging augmented reality are really providing a much clearer image of situational awareness in the field for fire and county and search and rescue officers. I'm delighted today to have Romeo Dersher from DJI um, talk a little bit about our public safety and integration practices at DJI. We also have Adam Kaplan from EdgyBees who's been developing a cutting edge groundbreaking AR application that runs on the DJI software for real-time visualization for people in the field. And then we also have Tim Davis with Oshawa County Fire to Rescue has been doing amazing work in the field, looking at how this technology can be leveraged and talking a little bit about how they're actually de deploying this in real time. Just to give you guys a few, inf few pieces of information, we do have a questions tab and a chat tab. If you have any questions during the during the presentation today, please feel free to add them into the questions tab. We have a Q&A at the end. We'll be doing our best to address all of the questions. If you have any connection issues, please feel free to add them to the chat and we'll do our best to resolve them for you. Lastly, we do have a handout section. There are two um, PDFs based on some of the slides you'll be able to see today. Um, feel free to look at them and download them. So a little a quick agenda view from the webinar today. We will basically bring a quick intro for each of our presenters. This will be a uh, bio just to give you a bit of their background and the work they've been doing in the field. We will all be having the presentation that they've put together. We will have a panel discussion and a quick Q&A. Great. Um, so moving forward here, we were going to go ahead and start looking with uh, uh, Romeo, would you mind advancing the slides? Perfect. So I'd like to do a quick introduction of our Director of Public and Sa Director of Public Safety and Integration at DJI, Romeo Dersher. Romeo has been with DJI a little bit over four years now and has been leading and advising the first responder and humanitarian organizations on how they can best and use and safely implement drones into their workforce. Uh, commercial UAV News actually named Romeo one of the top 25 most influential people into the commercial drone industry, as well as the top seven drone visionaries in emergency response and public safety. Romeo, thank you so much for joining us today, and we look forward to the presentation you have for us. 
Thank you, Brandon, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, and potentially good evening to everyone. Uh, I want to quickly give you an idea of DJI and how we have gotten here to this point. And let's look a little bit back because this is a good reflection of the entire commercial uh, drone industry. In 2006, DJI started with roughly 20 employees. Today, we're over 14,000 people strong. And what's very remarkable is that about one quarter of those are R&D engineers. That's an extremely powerful team that can take uh, needs and build solutions in almost no time. And that's very, very exciting. What once started out being a company for the hobbyists, for, for the creatives, for the people that wanted to do some fun stuff has really now also emerged into an enterprise company where we can get our technology into different verticals to help with workflow. At DJI, what we're trying to do is we're really trying to focus on high performance, accessibility, flexibility, and affordability, and have that all together in one platform. And if we're going to look now at the role of a drone, it's actually quite fascinating because we have uh, the data capture portion. So that consists of a drone and then a sensor. Um, we're all mostly used to a visible light camera, but there are additional sensors. And what we're going to do with all of that is, in essence, data processing either on board or then with analytic software on the ground. And based on all of that, we want to execute, we want to get data to help us make a better decision or a faster decision or any decision at all. So this is really kind of like the ecosystem of a drone, data capture, data processing, and then based on all of that, an execution. Now let's look at how we gotten into the public safety sector. In 2015, I started uh, discussions with INA. INA is the European Emergency Number Association. And uh, I had already realized at the time that eventually our technology can help public safety as well as humanitarian organizations, but we needed to really get a much better understanding of this particular vertical. We created four pilot test sites uh, through the INA project, uh, two search and rescue, two fire uh, sites, and really started to test technology and see how it's being utilized in the field. And then we also continued engaging with additional public safety entities all across uh, the United States and, and really tried to get that understanding of what is needed and what can we do in order to meet some of those needs. In 2017, we released a white paper on the INA project that really was giving readers the opportunity to look into what is currently happening, what are some of the uh, operational technical, what are some of the safety issues that come up if you have a drone program, but we also wanted to give recommendations to the stakeholders on how they could potentially implement a drone program and, and what the challenges were. And then, of course, we, honor, we wanted to be the, the vocal discussion point um, in regards to new initiatives, as well as uh, the legislative environment. Some of the lessons that we learned very early on were there actually is no one integration model that, that works for everyone. There are a variety of different integration models when you have a, a drone team now becoming part of an existing structure. And it really depends on how your department is structured, what, what, what it looks like, what your goals are. So there's no one right answer. And some of the very early adapters of the technology have realized that this is not only a technology that can be used during an incident, but we can also utilize it pre-incident and then post-incident as well. And the ARPAS, the drone, the UAV, has become an expendable tool. And that is a very, very interesting uh, learning experience because the data that the drone is gathering is now becoming more valuable than the actual platform itself. And that means we can utilize it in, in, the, in ways we probably wouldn't have done before. 
we also realized additional sensors are needed. Uh, it's great to have uh, visible light cameras, but of course, if we have thermal capabilities, we can do so much more. So uh, we do now have a variety of, of thermal cameras available, but there are more sensors that we can utilize uh, up in the air. And so the research continues on. Of course, the hardware needs to be more rugged because we're going into environments that are not uh, uh, your, your beautiful blue skies, no wind type of environments. The use of the drone is not only outdoors, but we're seeing more and more indoor use capabilities. And that changes the way uh, our technology is being developed and additional sensors that we integrate to, to help fly these platforms in an indoor environment where you may not have GPS. And of course, one of the very big lessons learned is we need to have proper live streaming capabilities because the drone operator itself can be the data bottleneck. And the last thing we want is an incident commander looking over the operator's shoulder and now you have two people uh, kind of tied up. So live streaming capabilities are very much needed. And we need more actionable data. And augmented reality is one piece to that puzzle and a very important piece. So some of the advancements are we created new models. Uh, we have the M200 series platform that, that has come out of many of the lessons learned during the very early days. We've created additional apps internally as well as externally that help with the operation. And we included additional capabilities into our ecosystem. In this case, Flight Hub, which is a live streaming platform, but also a platform that allows you to maintain and manage your, your fleet as well as your operators. Now, when we're looking at augmented reality, one of the early solutions I started working on was the Epson Moverio BT300 glass. And in essence, it's a see-through glass that has a little screen uh, embedded and it allows you to see the drone footage right in front of your eyes, but still keep situational awareness. And through that, this is what it would look like. You see what's going on, but you also see your drone in front of you. But through that, you can then also create augmented reality overlays like this particular um, Mavic uh, Pro that is flying indoors and it becomes kind of like a training um, platform. So those were from a hardware perspective, the, the, the first time we, we kind of started to integrate AR into the ecosystem. And in, in, in May of last year, I met with Adam uh, from AGBs and we started talking about the need for having AR overlays on top of the live video stream. And Adam is now going to then talk about what they have done, what AGBs is, and what first response their app is and can provide to you. If you have any questions, these, this is my contact information right here. And I'm going to hand it over to Brandon now. Perfect. Thank you so much, Romeo. Um, it's great to see all the work you've been putting in and actually looking at how this has been developed over the last, uh, the last four years, really. So everyone, up next, we're going to be handing over the presentation to Adam Kaplan. Adam is the co-founder and CEO for EdgyBees. Um, Adam is an avid drone pilot um, and has basically been working to merge his passion for flying aircraft and volunteerism with an extensive background in technology. Um, and really what that does, it helps Adam um, drive the EdgyBees mission to provide real-time visual intelligence technology to pilots, ground personnel, and command, con command control systems around the world. So Adam, thank you so much for joining us. We're excited to see some of your presentation and work you've been doing on the EdgyBees app. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, so uh, once again, I appreciate the kind words. Uh, thank you so much, Romeo, for the partnership that we've uh, been building the past year or so. Um, People ask what exactly uh, EdgyBees does, and in terms of uh, um, describing what we do, we've seen broadcasting of sporting events where you're broadcasting a live sporting event and you're transmitting it back to people to watch the game, you're circling a player. We've seen that with John Madden in a football game. We've seen that with uh, the PGA where they're showing where the trajectory of a golf ball. Uh, and we sat down and we met with Romeo um, uh, May of last year when we were doing a game and 
he talked to us about various scenarios where, as opposed to broadcasting a football game, we can be broadcasting a fire or a police uh, mission and, uh, and, and helping the, this information for the pilot, the command center, and the people on the ground. So we started specking out um, this product with, uh, um, with folks, and um, we were um, working with them and understanding that uh, this is something where we could uh, um, now talk about how they can understand instantly what they can do with the real-time collaborative intelligence that we bring to them. So when you're looking at a scene and uh, you're coming on for a firefighter or any type of public safety scenario, the first thing you want to understand is where are you located so we can overlay the street maps in real time over that video so that information can be sent back via live video feeds to the people that are flying the drone, the, the folks that are on the ground, as well as back to the command center. Additionally, you will understand what, what are the numbers of the buildings. So as opposed to being on a two-way radio, um, you are a, a, absolutely ability to visually share with folks as to where they are. So we're placing where a suspect might be, where a, uh, uh, a mission might be, where the cars that are inside of the, that are trying to approach that as well as give them uh, understand where other drones or where other um, critical personnel may be on the ground and all of this information is shared. So we can also uh, route free show you where is the appropriate route that they need to be taken. So all of this information is dynamic. It can be sent to people via feeds or you can be manually placing that information either as the pilot or to the folks on the ground. Uh, and all of this information can be uh, placed to those folks and, uh, and that information can be sent over to them and, um, and, and can be placed to those, those people. Um, in general, the uh, information that can be done there is, is all sent uh, to those people and this information can be, um, can be sent to, to everyone there. So, Additionally, you have grid maps, you have other information that can be sent to those people. Additionally, you've got a fire, you're in the nighttime, you want to have the ability to, once again, place those maps, this information, sharing where the other fire engines may be, where the, where the hydrants, all of this information, all of this data is shared with the people on the ground. Uh, we can put customized maps to understand where are the gas pipes and all of this information to those those people? Um, there's one that you can share with the, where other people are, uh, other types of data, all of this input can be manually inputted. Um, this information can be shared via an iOS device, uh, Android, Crystal Sky, all of this information is um, done via mobile devices, PCs, and can be uh, shared with one another. Um, so thermal imaging, once again, quite critical in these mission critical situations. So the ability to overlay this information, especially in a thermal imaging scenario, uh, is something that's very important to give you that context over that video to understand where you are, what you need to achieve, understand um, what buildings you're looking at, where your targets, and so on. So um, in short, uh, EGBs is able to ingest this video, allow you to respond quickly, manage your incidents in efficient and an immersive and collaborative way. So you're allowing for uh, the folks on the ground, the people in the command center, the drone pilots, all to be in real time visual communication. Um, so we're helping first responders and we've been pleased to partner and allow drone feeds to, to geo-rectify and put in those layers that allow you to show maps, buildings, layouts, points of interest, user-generated um, points of interest, and all of these data layers uh, can be provided via visual context for operational intelligence. So I will now turn this over to Tim and, uh, and move from here. Thank you very much, everybody. Awesome, thank you, Adam. No, I think, I think what you're doing at EGBs is really amazing. Um, augmented reality is something that DJI put into the drones about 
maybe two years ago at a very simple level, just providing a home point. And I think this really is the future, kind of not necessarily new sensors on aircraft, although new sensors always will be very powerful, but this sensor fusion where we now have the ability to actually overlay information on top of these more advanced sensors. So thank you for all the work you've been doing at Edubees and for that presentation. Um, next, everyone, I would like to introduce Tim Davis. Uh, Tim is a network administrator for the Oshawa County Fire Rescue. Tim's worked in public safety for 25 years and is the network administrator for Oshawa, fire, uh, Oshawa County Fire Rescue. Um, he has served as the paramedic, firefighter, and rescue lieutenant um, for them since two, uh, for quite some time now. In 2014, he co-founded the Oshawa County Fire Rescue UAS team. This was in an effort to bring critical, real-time, actionable data to the command staff during emergency incidents and post-disaster. Thank you very much for joining us, Tim, and I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Adam. I really appreciate being invited to this panel. Um, Lottery County Fire Rescue, if you don't know, is located in North Central Florida. We are a combined fire and EMS agency. Uh, we cover about 947 square miles and we respond to about 45,000 uh, responses a year. And if you're not familiar with Gainesville, we're also home to the University of Florida. Um, like a lot of teams out there, our, our paths have been different, but the destination, I think, has been the same. Um, we started out wanting to do damage assessment, GIS, search and rescue, and command reconnaissance, which, looking back, was a pretty big bite to take at one time. Um, full disclosure, our team had no RC or aviation experience when we started. But we were fortunate at the time to reach out to Florida State University's Emergency Management and Homeland Security Program, which is... Uh, headed by Dave Merrick, who provided some invaluable training. I can't continue that without saving uh, John McBride, Darren Goodbar, Garrett Brill. All these folks have taken their time to produce videos and content that's helping public agencies like myself uh, expand our program. Um, shortly after the release of the Phantom II, we were able to demonstrate on a wildfire to a command that how valuable Aerial, uh, an aerial platform was. Uh, basically, in five minutes, we were able to show the whole fire scene in addition to structures that were threatened, and that was unheard of at that time. Our team now consists of six personnel, all Part 107 certified, and we have a mix of operations and IT folks. Uh, we will be hopefully adding some emergency management personnel and also adding some GIS personnel in the near future. Fast forward to uh, 2017 at the Airworks Conference in Denver, we first met Edubees. We were hot off the heels of two very large events for our team. And some of the issues that came up during those events were basically communications, which is quite normal failure in a lot of missions. Um, the ability to use a product that gave real-time augmented reality data to pilots and command at the same time, you know, we just hadn't heard of at the time. Our current team uses uh, Mavic's Phantom Pro and Spire 2. Uh, we have had a very gracious donation recently that we'll be adding an M210 to our fleet in just a couple of weeks. And we have a UAS vehicle dedicated to response that uh, we try to keep ready for a three to five day deployment. So why EDUBEES? Um, after talking to them in Denver and seeing the potential capabilities that we could use at our department, uh, we started testing in February of this year. And coming from an IT background, and I say this rarely, it was reliable and straight out of the box dependable. It did exactly what they advertised it would do. They didn't overproduce or overpromise, and uh, we were very impressed. Some of the things it allowed our uh, department to do is allow command staff to observe UAS operations. Prior to this, everything was done by radio. They had no visual representation of what was going on within the uh, missions that we were doing. Not only as a command perspective, but pilots had pilot-to-pilot -pilot communication before. They were able to see other drones in their airspace. They were able to do deconfliction without any radio traffic. And one of the big things that we've been able to benefit from is they were able to share and receive taskings through the markers that you could place in an event. And one last thing that really came as a surprise to us, 
there's a first response tracker app. So not only could we do these things with drones and through the command and control application, but we could also track ground personnel through a smartphone app. So going back to February, we hosted a joint mobile exercise with FSU. And if you're familiar with the South, I just said that the University of Florida reached out to FSU for a joint exercise. You don't hear that a lot, but I can tell you those guys have been great to work with. Um, that MOBEX was meant to simulate UAS actions during, a, a, during or after a major storm, uh, where we conducted damage assessment, search and rescue. But a big part of that exercise was actually using manned and unmanned flight operations in the same airspace. Throughout that exercise, our team used EGBs for our, mate, our primary piloting app. A couple pictures from that exercise. Um, we set up command and control in our mobile uh, operations center, and they were able to observe in admittedly a very poor cellular environment all the drone operations that were in place. So shortly thereafter, our team got together and we discussed EGBs. And what we realized is we weren't using it to its full potential. Um, we realized that by dropping markers, that had abbreviations associated with tasks that we could relay a lot of information between pilots and command without ever being on the radio, greatly reducing radio traffic. So all these abbreviations assigned with a priority, which we indicate by marker color, we could, uh, for example, take INB SMS, which in a marker would represent investigate this marker or location, take a picture and SMS that to the list that we set up prior to the mission. And if you're not familiar, uh, you can set up multiple contacts and relay that information to all those contacts at one time. There's a couple of screenshots here on the left. This is from the piloting app. Um, very simple to place a marker. You just long press on the screen, or if you're in the command app, you just long press the left mouse button, and it will drop a marker on that location. Right away, you can assign a color, which for us means the priority of that marker, and it gives you a lat long and a street address. On the right, you can see in the simulated hazmat event, this is a fuel depot located next to our headquarters. You can identify where the hazard is. We can place access for responding units, an LZ, IC. You know, the, it's really limitless to your imagination. But a big part of that, which it's already been discussed is the road structure that we can see. Back during Hurricane Irma, a lot of our roads were flooded um, and, or overgrown by vegetation. Having that GIS layer there to visually observe where the road should be is a great benefit to the uh, pilots. So the next slide is just going to be a quick uh, video that we did on a uh, demoing, demoing a quick mission. Um, it is done in real time. It's about a minute and a half. I'll pause it a couple of times to point out a couple of features. Customer demoing. So, and this in the upper left is the command app. You, uh, you can see markers are being dropped. On the right of the screen and the lower screen are the pilot's view. As those markers are produced, they're placed in the pilot's view. You can see that Rogue One on the top right is executing that marker. They have the ability to see the other drones in the picture. And now Rogue Two has been given its mission. You can toggle the field of view of those pilots. And as you can see, Rogue One, their camera is pointed straight down, and that's indicated by the cone of view that's represented in the command app. The road structure is visible. I have a complete situational awareness of the mission that's being accomplished or executed. We train our pilots to scan for marker changes in the app as they're flying. And as you can see coming up, a screenshot was sent and that was sent via text message. Oh, coming back here. Of course, the IT guy has a technical issue. I apologize. 
but basically after that screenshot was taken, an SMS message was sent out. Um, you receive a picture, a lat long, and some other useful information after that is sent out via an SMS. So that's how Alachua County is using this information. Um, we continue to meet as a team, and we're constantly giving suggestions to EDUBEES, always have a wish list. Uh, but this has been the first application that we've used that's answered a lot of questions. That's the ability for our pilots to fly, have an interaction between command, and also have a lat long that's easily displayed wherever we drop a marker. We know exactly where our drones are while they're in flight. And I guess the, the biggest component for us is adding that information back to our emergency operations center or command staff. Like I said previously, prior to that, it's been radio traffic. So this visually, visual representation of the missions is just unheard of. Um, so we really appreciate what EDUBEES has produced. Um, I can tell you as a vendor, they have been great to work with. Uh, they have been more receptive to our suggestions, and we hope to have a great partnership in the future. Excellent. Tim, thank you very, very much for that presentation. Um, it's very, very interesting to see what you've been doing with Florida State University in that exercise. And it's great to see that this is really working in the field and providing a little bit more clear communication between the different teams during these emergency operations. So, up next, everybody, um, we would like to do a little bit of Q&A. Um, a few of the people here have asked some questions. Um, so we're going to be working with Romeo, Adam, and Tim um, to answer a few of the questions that you have today. Um, Adam has, oh, on his screen, we had, um, a a Tim, would you mind going back and just, yeah, doing the last slide? Perfect. So if any anybody has questions that weren't answered um, today, please feel free to send an email to Romeo, Adam, or Tim. And the goal right now is just to kind of talk through some of the questions that have been posed um, through uh, the, the question tab um, so far. And so this one I'm going to go ahead and direct to Romeo. Um, Jorgen Rong has asked, does Flight Hub support other data centers um, other than AWS in the US? Um, they would preferably like to use a private cloud. That's, that's a very good question and uh, we, we are working on additional solutions um, to utilize uh, our, our entire ecosystem. So um, please do send an email to me and uh, I can provide you with some additional information. But yeah, we, we do want to uh, make sure that we're meeting uh, the security requirements and concerns of our various uh, different uh, verticals. So definitely always something that, that we keep in mind. Excellent. The next question comes from Thomas Kennedy, and let's go ahead and direct this to Adam. Adam, the question is, um, are the G, are the AR overlays, is it GIS based? Um, where is the information sourced from? Oh, Adam, I think you're on mute. Okay. How about we just come back to that question in a moment? Um, Adam, are you there? Uh, I'm here. We go. Uh, there was a little mute problem there. Can you repeat the question, please? I had some trouble unmuting myself. No problem. So it was from Thomas Kennedy, and he, he wanted to know um, the the AR overlays. Is it GIS based? Um, essentially, where is the information sourced from? Yeah. So information that we receive as overlays it can indeed be GIS based. Um, that we get the feeds from multiple types of uh, maps. And then we take that sensor information, sensor fusion, and we implement that. We do use, not always the sensor data is uh, correct. So we use computer vision to make sure that they're accurately placed. Additionally, um, so we can take those feeds and then also uh, other GPS information can be manually placed on those um, maps by them by the people themselves, or you can customize your own KML files as well. Very perfect. Thanks, Adam. The next question actually is kind of an addition to this, and it comes from Pat. And is the AR overlay stored locally on the ground control uh, mobile device, or is it supplied via network connection? 
Uh, the the answer is that we can indeed do both of those. We you can have it either stored locally or it can also be stored uh, locally. It can be put on the cloud. Perfect. And is there any integration with the ArcGIS online? Um, so I believe you're speaking about ArcGIS uh, ESRI. Um, we are currently in development with the ArcGIS uh, solution. So that's uh, that is in our roadmap. Perfect. And I think one of the last questions here, Adam, is, is how real time is real time for edgy bees? Um, we got a sense of it in the video from Tim, um, but do you have any kind of more information you can dive into on that? Um, it's about uh, everyone here is familiar with flying the DJI Go um, and flying. So we it, it, all of this information is indeed the same latency, the same way in which you're flying today uh, is indeed. Uh, it's, it's, so this is indeed real time. Perfect. And I think the next question comes from Eric DeBoer, and this could technically go to Adam and Tim, so I'll let you guys decide what's best. Is Are there sensors that could be placed on personnel um, that could keep their location up to date, or does it just need to be inputted manually for right now? Uh, so, yes, indeed, we have trackers on your phones, and we believe there will be future other trackers. I'll, I'll let Tim speak a little bit how he's testing and using some of the trackers on phones but tim maybe you could speak a little bit so this is indeed uh being tracked uh, on folk on other folks phones so tim maybe i'll i'll turn it over to you absolutely so we have tested this on an ios device um, basically an iphone and even in a 3g environment we found that the tracker app was you know almost instantaneous in fact going back just to the previous question, the latency that we see in a regular 4G environment between the command app, the piloting apps, is really minimal. Um, and that applies to the tracker app as well. Perfect. Now, Adam, we have a question here from Vincent Preston, um, and this is kind of how some of the people listening on the w webinar today can have access to EduBees. Um, he said, is there kind of a trial product key? Are they able to download the app? Um, can you maybe talk a little bit to about what access people on the webinar today would have to the EduBees app? Yeah, so our team, what, if you go to, you know, if you look for it, we essentially have a trial period to, to use it. We have some folks that do trials, some people that purchase it, but we have a program in which we can work out a uh, program with you. We ha are supporting most DJI drones and the most cameras. One of the reasons why we're doing not doing off the shelf is just for compatibility reasons. As uh, our friends from DJI release products very quickly, so um, we are we hurry up to make sure we get on the platforms. It's true. They, yeah. Sorry, Adam. The the product velocity at DJI is a little bit uh, insane at the moment. So we we appreciate your team's <laughs> diligence to uh, keep up with the uh, the products that keep coming out. Um, and so I, the next question we have up comes from Steve Perry here. Um, and Tim, I would like to direct this one to, towards you, which is kind of more of an operational question is, um, what kind of COA or certificate of authorization um, did you need to get to do these operations? Was it a blanket COA or just jurisdictional uh, uh, approvals? So we operate with uh, two COAs, we do have a blanket and a jurisdictional. We are fortunate in Alachua County that we only have one regional airport that's class D airspace. And we are, um, depending on the missions, we either fly under 107 or our COA. Now, as part of our COA, all of our staff are required to be 107 certified. Um, if I hope that answers your question. No, I, I think that's great. I think a lot of people here are, you know, interested in using this technology and some of the regulatory um, hurdles can be quite daunting at first, but I think it's great to see people are out there doing it and working through and really establishing the process. So thanks, thanks for kind of providing a little bit of light there, um, Tim, on that. Um, uh, the next one, let's go ahead and add this, have this Adam answer this one. This one comes from um, Musadak. And it's how does the marker you drop as a pilot make it back to the GIS infrastructure? Um, Adam, can you provide any light on that workflow? So um, in terms of when the marker is dropped, the marker is placed to the ground. So as the pilot is flying, uh, he or she can, is, is able to have it a real time on their map. And that is all being recorded. 
um, and then this is being transferred and all of that video or the pic or the pictures such as the SMS that Tim had showed you uh, can be sent to those uh, folks and then sent back to the command and control center. Perfect. Um, very good, very good. Um, and I think this actually kind of goes to all parties involved, um, Romeo, Adam, and Tim, since you've operated in such diverse environments. Um, and this comes from John Monaco. And what is the contingency process if a cell network is down? Um, has anybody tested that? Um, how that impacts the current workflow? Um, maybe you guys can shed a little bit of light on that. Um, I can comment a little bit on that. We had real-time uh, scenarios where that happened. So, for example, we were working um, after in the aftermath of a number of emergency situations where uh, that went out. So, for example, um, we have some of the collaborative capabilities do indeed near need the comms on them. But what we uh, the contingency is that for a radius of a certain amount of miles you're able to download the maps ahead of time and have them cached on your phone or your tablet so if the comms go down you still are receiving the video you do have maps over a certain uh, amount of area because that information has been downloaded ahead of time and allows for those folks to uh, allows for those folks to understand still and use the ar and use the maps and use the video Adam, uh, this is Tim. Do you mind if I expand on that a little bit? Sure, that'd be great. Nothing like the real user. <laughs> We've done several tests and simulated disconnects in flight. And basically what happens is on the pilot app, you're made aware that the markers that you're now placing are not going to be synchronized. Um, on the command side, you obviously see no telemetry coming in from that particular drone that's dropping the markers. You can, however, continue to operate dropping markers in the pilot app that the pilot can utilize. I can still drop markers within the command app, and once that connectivity is reestablished, those markers will sync within the same flight and the same mission. Perfect. Now, gentlemen, thank you so much for elaborating on that. Um, and I think you've done a good job of kind of understanding right what the infield requirements are. Um, and this actually, I think, may be a chance for us to step back. So I'm going to combine questions from Carlos, Siddharth, and Jerry. And the questions really are is, um, does EGBs take the place of DJI Go? Um, and how does it work with the different DJI platforms? Um, and is it intuitive? So realistically, from a workflow, are we using DJI Go for um, these types of in-field operations? is the sole source app EGBs. Can we maybe talk through kind of a workflow of turning the drone on to actually flying during the operations? Tim, I'll let you take that. <laughs> so as part of our normal operations, we always start our pre-flight checks within the Go app. Um, we conduct a quick pre-flight, uh, quick flight, we land, and then we launch the EGBs app. From that point on, we continue only in EGBs. Um, we have tested in flight the return to home features, uh, RC disconnects, and the alarms that you would normally see in the Go app, and we receive also through the EGBs app. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, I think that helps provide a little bit more clarity on really what the workflow looks like in the field. So we have a few questions um, and I do absolutely um, ask some of the people that are, uh, would like a little bit more information on EGBs, some of the more technical questions that we're seeing in the chat here, to actually send that to Adam um, in an email. Um, and then we can also start talking through some of the other questions here. We do need to wrap up in just a few moments. So maybe we'll do one or two more questions. Um, uh, I do want to address one thing from Nina here, which was, uh, does the technology work with 5G? And so I think this is obviously not available commercially just yet, but this is really a question to kind of Adam, Tim, Romeo, as we see a greater bandwidth or a bigger pipeline for this data to be moving through, um, how will that kind of change the operations? Is it just going to be higher quality? Is there more data that we can essentially put onto these overlays? 
what do we see kind of the future of 5G technology bringing NGBs um, to, to the DJI platform? Let me take a, a first step at this. Um, we, we live in, in very, very interesting times with, with all the technology that is becoming available. But when you're out on a mission uh, or if you're in a disaster area, two things become gold to you. One is power and the second one, the ability to connect and have communications. And sometimes both of them are hard to come by and it, it almost makes you feel like you're stepping back in time uh, because suddenly uh, you, you're really realizing how valuable it is to have access to power, to not only charge batteries and charge your devices, but then to properly communicate. And, and what we're seeing these days is um, a, a very big need for reducing the amount of day that we want to push. It's in essence, uh, you're trying to get an elephant through a little pipe and now we want to shrink that elephant to only send the most valuable data uh, through the through the, that pipe and a lot of projects are happening um, on, on a variety of different uh, scales and, and areas to to figure out how can we make it so that really the most relevant information is being sent we may not need a you know 20 megapixel picture going through the pipeline when we're only interested in a little tiny aspect of that particular image so with increased bandwidth um, we're we're of course happy to see that that we can push more data but in reality um, we oftentimes operate in environments where we don't have the ability to utilize 4g lte or even in the future 5g so we still need to have ways to downsize the data sample. And I think EGBs is doing a, a very solid job on, on downsizing uh, some of that. And there are additional uh, solutions that are on the market or will come to market in, in the not too distant future. Perfect. Adam, Tim, was there anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I think so. Romeo summed it up very well. As we get to faster networks, um, the, the capabilities will just grow and grow. Um, I think that the 5G is going to open up a whole set of use cases and possibilities where, where we're um, going to be doing more and more things live. Um, you know, 5G is something that's coming along. Uh, I understand that the next Olympics is going to be done via 5G. There's I think uh, the, the number, it's going to be infinitely faster, uh, I think 100 times faster than we're, what we're doing today. So uh, it's going to open up our possibilities tremendously. Uh, I think that when Romeo and you know, I started talking, um, it, we're seeing use cases that uh, it's, it's, it's pretty amazing seeing where uh, these drones use cases and these live use cases are going, whether it's for a PGA uh, event or whether it's for broadcasting or for various other types of things uh, for public safety, it's, it's going to give us a, a huge opportunity. So to keep with kind of the forward thinking questions, and again, thank you all the participants we've had asking questions. There is a never ending stream of them. So again, please do send um, your questions directly to the three, three team members we have here that can help answer them. But let's leave this as kind of the final question and try to keep it a forward thinking one as well. Um, and this is directed really towards Adam and I would like Tim and Romeo to comment as well. And it's really, has EGBs worked on overlaying 3D models um, into this image as well? A lot of what we've talked about today is 2D. Um, what opportunities do we think 3D models are going to be bringing to the table as far as um, the capabilities of AR and UAS? Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. And yes, indeed, we are in the pro process of implementing where you could take a, a 3D model and overlay that to the ground. Uh, so whether that's in the world of construction or in a, um, a scenario where you wanna overlay 3D models, this, this information can indeed be nailed to the ground via 3D model. So I think that there's gonna be opportunities out there, whether it's 3D, 2D, all of this information is, is where it's going. Awesome. And Tim, Romeo, did you have any other thoughts on where you see 3D models um, being leveraged in the field today? 
Absolutely. I, I think one aspect that we're that we haven't really touched upon yet is uh, training. Um, I, I oftentimes spend uh, the training days with departments and I always enjoy uh, watching their training and being part of it, but oftentimes uh, they tend to go out on a soccer field or a wide open area and they do certain scenarios and potentially a few hours later they could be on a real scenario call and the difference between training something on a soccer field and then actually being in that scenario uh, just moments later is, is quite big. So uh, Adam and I we initially talked about the vision of having a burning building overlaid on top of that soccer field and there is smoke and there is uh, you know a lot of visuals going on just like in real life and now uh, the operator has a mission to do and do a certain flight path uh, avoid the smoke get certain um, visuals and and at the end of the flight, the, the, the software potentially can analyze the execution of it and say, hey, you know, you got a you know, 95 out of 100, uh, well done, or you got 25 out of 100, uh, uh, keep, keep exercising. So there's also on the training side, tremendous opportunities with the overlay of 3D objects. Very interesting. Yeah, I think having the opportunity to keep pilot skills fresh and not just, and, you know, have somebody have to jump in and be ready to go. And, you know, when there are only emergency situations is so valuable and helps kind of keep the panic level down for some of these operators in the field. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. We do have a very, very long list of questions. Again, I really do invite you to reach out to all of our panelists today directly. I'm sure they'll be happy to help you answer some of them. I'd also like to take kind of the closing moments to thank Romeo, Adam, and Tim for really kind of forging ahead and being kind of trailblazers as far as not only leveraging UAS technology, but really looking to the future as far as what augmented reality can really bring from a solution standpoint to the field. And Tim really just kind of being one of the first counties to really be looking at leveraging this to save lives and keep people safe um, and operate ultimately more efficiently as well. So thank you all for your insights today. Um, they were very, very informative to me and I'm sure the rest of the people attending. Um, and again, thank you for joining the DJI webinar. Um, this will be recorded, so feel, please feel free to share this with anybody that you think would find value out of the webinar today. And thank you again to all of our panelists.